Hello, strange world. Welcome to the Aldergate Papers. My name is Adrian Ward, and these singed and crumpled pages are my diary, a record of the final days of my former life. I remember almost nothing of the story they contain, and the more I read, the less I wish to know. There is a shadow over Aldergate University, a shadow from which I barely escaped with my life, a shadow into which I must now step once more. And you're coming with me. We rejoin our hero just as this notebook is receiving the first of its many scars. Um, I'd been scribbling frantically when something, which shall remain nameless because I've no idea what it was, made a sort of thump noise from the direction of the library stairs. I will leave it to the historians to debate whether the fleeting shape that moved in the shadows was a slavering ghoul, or not that. The point is that at this juncture the notebook was thrown in haste and retrieved at leisure, somewhat worse for wear. Anyhow, this is Day Two, Part Two, Encounters with the Local Wildlife. It is the second day of the return to Aldergate. The time and place of writing is the edge of midnight, in the Arkwell Privy Library, atop the manse of the Vice-Chancellor. We begin. Ah. Get on with it, can't you? At this rate, you won't finish today's diary until tomorrow, and never get to bed at all. Then you'll be sorry. You'll miss out on all the lovely nightmares you're trying so hard to give yourself. Ugh. This really isn't like you, you know. This scared of your own shadow business. Yes, you are all alone in an unfamiliar place, but you're usually alone, and you're always staying in places even less familiar than this one. You're a happy road warrior, you must have slept in a thousand strange beds, untroubled except by indifferent Wi-Fi. And Kirk Bryce, that one time you made the mistake of agreeing to share a suite with the fellow. You always sleep well when you're traveling. When you want to sleep, at any rate. <laughs> ah, you remember that 72-hour sprint across the Caucasus and the Black Sea, when Whist was just a gleam in your little eye? The final stretch aboard the night train to Lorca. That pair of buskers you recruited, brother and sister. <laughs> they helped you seize the dining car so you could scribble on the tablecloths. Auprès de ma blonde, qui fait bon dormir. <laughs> Focus. Focus. Look, the point is, you can handle a change of habitat. You can handle missing a bit of sleep. Whence, therefore, this shrinking, shrieking, cowardly custard act. Back up, Ward. Humanity expects better from its last, best hope. <laughs> ah, yes. Back to this morning, and the Battle of the Pentangle. Ah. Clothes. Coat. Front door. Yes. You took your key, put out your tongue at Edmund Darkwell, and buttoned up the Chesterfield against the dawn chill. Shouldering the old satchel, can't leave sibling unattended, not with unknown visitors popping in and out, you shoved open the front door and stepped out onto a battlefield. It was a moment or two before you noticed. Dawn had barely more than cracked, and its first rays were struggling to oar top the lofty crowns of Kermandel and Empress. Anyhow, 
Your little gray cells were still gnawing away at that mysterious ladder, and when you turned to lock the door behind you, what little attention you had to spare was taken by the poster that some merry soul had pasted on it overnight. An odd poster, minimalist to a fault, but what little there was of it was... Yes, odd. Ah. Then we have... I drew a little diagram of the poster. In case anybody wants to see it, I can snap a photo, and it's a sort of glyph or sigil. Just a squiggle, really. Anyhow, the poster on the door was just the big squiggle, and underneath it, the words, 30 days. So, yes. Cryptic, what? Seems somebody's trying their hand at the old guerrilla marketing game. Count down to... Squiggle. The time of the squiggle is at hand. Silly. At least, it seems silly now. But this morning it struck you as yet another mystery, in a morning already soggy with the things. And the upshot was that you didn't notice the warfare until you were practically a part of it. <laughs> ah, thrust, parry, stab, and riposte. The scene playing itself out on your doorstep was a battle for the ages, specifically the age of chivalry and the age of the dinosaurs. The manse fronts right onto the pent, with only a bit of cobblestone in between, and you had hardly taken your first step out into the world when you had to give it back again. A hulking figure in a helmet with horns on barreled past you in the half-light, chainmail jingling and claymore raised to strike. It was met from your other side by a trident-wielding lizard with latex scales and wellington boots. The two clashed, practically in your lap, coulet and coupé, back and forth like mad and all the while two dozen other armored and scaled figures similarly clashed all around. Startling, eh? No wonder you're skittish. You started today with a jump, and you've been jumping ever since. No doubt a weaker man would have given the day up as a bad job and just gone to bed, but you remained. You observed. And presently the horned chap got in a mortal wallop on Fafnir's kid brother, and, stepping back, he noticed you for the first time. He raised a gauntleted fist in salute, and flipped up his visor to reveal a hearty round face with a sandy beard and a Bluetooth headset. Pressing a hand to his ear, he hissed something you couldn't quite make out, and in an instant the pitched battlers paused and turned your way in unison. Then the non-Saurians among them advanced upon your position, weapons held high. Through the morning fog you heard their whispered cries. The king! The king! The king! Thus began your brief, but undeniably glorious, reign over a silent larp. Your loyal human vassals, resplendent in clinking steel and squeaking PVC, formed a serried wall to shield your royal person. Then the dragonfolk, who had tactfully given them a moment to get situated, attacked with cold-blooded fury. Fear ye not, sire. Your bulky young protector fell into step beside you, guarding your flank as you made your way past the stately iron palings of Kermantle's pentwood face. His mighty blade, conscientiously wrapped in foam rubber, wrought carnage and desolation among all who dared approach. Forward, he roared, sotto voce, into his headset. We shall give our lives to the last man, ere we let fall the crown of Albion into the claws of the growl. Dashed good of him, what? Quite the proper feudal spirit. Of course, you'd intended to nip off down Belly Alley, had to get to your office in central administration, where, for all you knew, Baz was waiting with a corpse and a pair of shovels. Under the cirques, however, you felt that cutting out like that would have been poor form. 
so you played along. The musical egg blessed your royal parade, tootling gently overhead for a bit as you strode past stately old empress, past the arabesque colonnade and honeycombed portal of Whipple College as the battle for humanity's future raged around you. At that point, you were as far from where you were going as you could get, so you carried on and completed the circuit. A bit of a victory lap for the prodigal son. Chamber College's pentwood face looks just as it did in your day, and every other day since the 1100s. Yet, leaf subsides to leaf, and nothing old can stay unharassed by modernity. Cresting the hoary Anglo-Saxon limestone wall, the tip of the crystal pine cone glowed in the first light of day, looking as bright and odd as it did when it was just a little scale model on Sir Reggie's desk. So, they built it after all. About time, too. The officially unsolved explosion that left one of the Chamber College residence halls structurally unsound happened before you ever came to Aldergate, but they hadn't yet broken ground on its replacement when you left. Institutional inertia, no doubt. Or university politics. The Society of Preservationists must have been apoplectic about it. Use that as a chip if they give you flack about updating the manse. Whatever you end up wanting to do to the place, you can promise not to replace it with something that looks like the arse end of a Swarovski artichoke. Anyhow, you completed the circuit, on past dear old Elden House and back to where you started. Then, because enough's enough, you delivered a bit of the St. Crispin's Day speech and took your leave. Beardy Bloke led a murmured huzzah, then turned to argue with a lizard that had beamed him with an opportunistic fireball. The whispers of war faded as you made your regal way down Halley Alley. Ribbons of early morning mist hung over the alder, largely undisturbed by the barrow hall sculling crew faffing about in midstream. On along the river walk to University Place. The beacons atop the Tower of Empire. Ah. A quick geographical note. I ought to put up a sketch or something to give you a sense of the layout of Aldergate. But all you really need to know at the moment is that University Place is a sort of crossroads, meeting of the ways place. A good spot for expressing your political views, or performing your latest masterpiece, or just catching a sunburn, weather permitting. The whole thing is actually rather a clever piece of ancient engineering, because, you see, the rivers actually run underneath it. The sluggish old order wanders in from the west, and the River Fay comes shooting down from Fay Water just north of Altergate proper. They meet up underneath the University Place and come spilling out into a wide bit of open water called the Mingle. It's quite pretty. On sunny days you can see where the swells of the two rivers haven't quite mixed yet, the browny-greeny Alder and the dark, clear Fay. You can feel it, too, if you are swimming. Fay water is exactly a thousand degrees colder. Anyhow, UP is built over the two rivers. Always has been. Goes back to Roman times, I think. At least. Certainly predates the university. It's hemmed in by the facades of five colleges. Going round like a clock face, at high noon you've got Salton House. Then, going clockwise, Warden College. Then there's Sylvan College. That's the pretty one they put in all the PR materials. Then, down at six o'clock, there's the Mingle, and then the gatehouse of Garden and Purse College. The rest, from nine o'clock to twelve, is the front face of Kermantle College, which boasts the largest collection of marble lions in captivity. And, in the middle of University Place, is the Tower of Empire. So, on we go. The beacons atop the Tower of Empire flickered pale against the watery eastern sky. Some students about, mostly hustling to or from labs, libraries, or beds, their own or otherwise. A few are just sort of hanging about, 
a sketch pad and a balaclava, staring raptly out over the mingle, sucking a pencil. A hula hoop, evidently frostproof, doing fearfully lissom things in a hooded leotard over on the Sultan House side. And two laptops, huddled in a shared sleeping bag on the Tempire steps, clacking away in fingerless gloves. You offered the laptops a lordly nod as you passed, and then you took a turn round the Tempire itself. Always a good idea if you want to know what's going on about town. <laughs> you know, someday an enterprising anthropologist will take core samples of the layers of posters and notices and so on, and make a sort of love handle around the bottom eight feet or so of the Tower of Empire. Above the high tide mark, the Tempire retains its stark, iconic profile, eight sides precise against the points of the compass. It's all very metaphorical. The facing stones are imports from around the globe, snatched from wherever all negation hands could stretch to grab them. Must have looked fantastic back in 1903. These days it's got a sort of patchwork quality. Not every stone's a building stone, and the English weather has worn the Tempire's face unevenly. <laughs> ah, a better metaphor even than intended. But the best part of this monument to the span of the university is the flags. Below the eight eternal gas braziers up top, sixteen spars project around the crown, from each angle and each face. From these hang the national flags of every country that boasts a living old legation. There were a hundred and fifty-two when you were here before, including the starfish banner of the stateless and renounced. No time to count flags this morning, of course. No, just a quick circuit to look at the outermost layer of the great sedimentary deposit of handbills. Rooms sought, rooms shared, furniture sold or traded. Several calls for volunteers for human trials. Oh, and mustn't forget the diverse entertainments and excursions. You helped yourself to a dozen leaflets and tear tags. Uh, let's see. Ah. Uh, all right. Something called King Midnight is back by popular demand at Brimstone House. Brimstone House? Rings no bells, but sounds rather fun. Thursdays are Electroswing Quartet Night at the Purple Monkey. I haven't been to the monkey in ages. Obviously. Double Trouble. Telltale Jack hosts The Vixen on the Vale College Padded Cellcast for a two-headed Monster Mash Wednesday, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Oh, The Vixen. Yeah, she's got her own gig as well. She's got a graphic designer, too, which puts her one up on Telltale Jack. He's just a little cartoon head with a long face and little round glasses, but the vixen looks to have stepped right out of an old-timey circus sideshow bill. <clears throat> Step right up. Be afraid. See the rockabilly zombie goth princess. Retro fright in black and white. Tunes and talk to light your night. Killer style and killer smile. 99.9 on the FM dial. Coming to you dead and live from McNaughton College. Oof. That's about as much personality as you can take on an empty stomach. Hang on, how is she in black and white if she's on the radio? Do people still do radio? Anyhow, uh, yes. Um, ahem. <clears throat> Anti-penultimate throwdown seven. Scapper flow versus club consciousness at the Bates Law Social Fountain. Um... Deathly Paul and the Skeletones will be giving an open-air performance down in the old barrows. Stab Tag Sanctuary Meetup at the Bester College Roastery. Stab Tag. Ugh. Oh, <laughs> Roller Drag Karaoke Brunch at the Den of Buggery. You should bring Baz along, see if it kills her. Lastly, Antigone is showing at the Aldergate Playhouse. 
Aldergate Playhouse. Aldergate Playhouse. Sounds vaguely familiar, but only the faintest tinkle. Young Adrian really was an antisocial little blighter. Here you were at an all-you-could-eat feast of reason, and you grabbed your one favorite dish and ran off to eat in the corner. Buried yourself in Bofax, when you could have been electro-swinging, and playing stab-tag. <sighs> ah, the tragedy of an inadequately misspent youth. Oh, and you mustn't forget the squiggle people. They get an A for effort at the very least. What their posters lack in specifics, they make up in volume. There are at least two dozen of them slapped up around the tempire. No words, no countdown even, just the squiggle. You can't say you're entirely consumed with curiosity, but perhaps the viral marketing has an incubation period. Hmm. And then there's the very official little notice, requesting that anyone who may have been in or near Last Quad in Gambrel College between the hours of midnight and 3 a.m. on the night of etc., etc. Very tactful, no gory details, but do please contact E. E. Standish, Chief Constable, Aldergate Constabulary. <sighs> On you went. Got to keep moving, eh? The Warden Tower clock showed two minutes to seven as you left University Place. The Carolyn was chiming the quarters in a little flurry of offended crows as you mounted the steps of the Central Administration Building. Not a bad commute, eh, self old chap? On days when you aren't waylaid by warriors, it shouldn't be more than a seven-minute jaunt door-to-door. -door. Beats trekking in from the Upper West Side every day. If you ever remember how to sleep, you can start sleeping in. As for Centad... Well, it's not quite fair, because anything would look dowdy next to Sylvan College. But the Central Administration Building does seem rather a dismal old heap. You never had much cause to notice it before. Its facade is all grey stone, windows sunken and furtive behind clusters of treble columns. A bit like the old State, War, and Navy Building in Washington, but bleaker. A breath of hothouse air puffed over you as you entered. Baz's little administrative army must fall into the some-like-it hot camp. They're not alone. The thick, aldergate vermilion carpet in the foyer was pretty well clogged with students, who, in warmer weather, would presumably have been lazing next door on King's Common. Every available inch of the big steam radiators along the walls had a notepad or a laptop sitting propped against it, and one particularly feline paperback in a Bester College hoodie had laid down a blanket and stretched out on top of one. You picked your way around a square of scripts who had taken up residence mid-floor and were lying, heads on thighs, doing a read-through of The Tragedy of the Guys. <laughs> As always, Sir Reggie said it best. By land or by sea, and home or abroad, our boys and girls, praise and pester em, produce scholarship the way a triple crown winner produces manure. In great quantity, that is to say. And also wherever, whenever, and however they please. And you wonder why Aldergate is not universally popular. Oof. And it won't be Sir Reggie who's got to saddle up and ride to the rescue the next time one of them follows the golden light of learning into some foreign prison or hostage situation. That's your job now, and it isn't the sort of job that finds you at your best. You're more of a slip-and-grip type. You'll build a strong hand and then defend it, but you've never had Sir Reggie's flair for bluff and arm-twisting. <laughs> To think you'd never really have appreciated the man if you hadn't spent so many afternoons carting his ill-gotten swag upstairs. The phone calls you overheard. <laughs> I want her on the next plane out of Manila, you understand? Aye. What's that? Speak up, blast you. 
No, see here, Inspector. I'd have given Tinker's balls if he caught her with the Cirque du Bleeding Soleil in her rectum. You won't know, Nicky, of course, but your boss's boss's boss will tell you he hasn't missed my birthday party since I cracked one of his molars in Cotabato back in 80. Be nice, sir. Hand the girl over to sweet. I shall descend upon Luzon like the Sixth Twisting Army. I shall pay you a visit that will make the Spanish and the Japanese seem like weakened house guests. Do I make myself clear? Bravo, sir. And what size hat do you take, Inspector? <laughs> ah, the memory of Sir Reggie will live long. It's got to do. The ghost of your illustrious predecessor will have to sustain the Pax Ortegaciensis without much help. You've got quite enough on your plate at present. Let's hope your new flock can behave itself until you've found your stride, eh? Find your stride. That's a laugh. You can't even find your office. You did your best to follow Baz's instructions, but Sentad's an awful corkscrew of a place. Nothing but forking corridors with uneven slopes that split into half-levels and then shoot off at an angle, until you don't know which floor you're on or what direction you're facing. <sighs> you gave it a go, anyhow. But you must have zigged when you ought to have zagged, because you'd hardly left that overstuffed foyer when you found yourself entirely alone, trotting through a gloomy sort of low-ceilinged hive of distressingly narrow hallways. It hardly seemed like the sort of neighborhood for the executive suite. So you picked up the pace and started taking turns as and when you fancied them, and the more lost and lonely you became, the faster you went until at last you rounded a blind corner and nearly crashed a chap to death. Pale, puffy, pop-eyed little blighter. Don't know what he thought he was playing at, though doubtless he felt just the same about you. But honestly, he'd walled himself off down there, or nearly. Waist-high stacks of semiotics texts, and a sort of parapet of playing cards on top of them. Well... His fortifications were no match for Vice-Chancellor Kaiju. <sighs> you excavated him from the ruins, and you apologized. Not that it was entirely your fault. You made a game effort at helping him to rebuild, but the poor fellow seemed so traumatized by the presence of another human being that, in the end, you just left him there in the wreckage, curled up in the fetal position hiding inside the hood of a big, stitchy overcoat. Are these your new subjects, self-old sport? Yes. Yes, they are. And you're there for them, not vice versa. Remember that. Where they are once were you, and you've no business putting your own mad little plans ahead of all the other dreams that haunt the corridors of Aldergate. If mute, inglorious Miltons choose self-imposed exile in the Central Administration Building, they do so for their own reasons. Where do you get off, condescending to a bloke just because he's sealed himself away with his books and his notes and his hoyle shellbacks? You've no idea what he was doing, but it's probably something dashed important, or valuable, or at least interesting. And if he didn't invent it himself, then he's bound to be top fifty in the world at it, and rising. You don't need to understand it, but you've got to respect it. After all, that's rather the whole point of Altergate, isn't it? The Office of Invitation is inscrutable in its methods, but it does not err. Anybody, anybody, be he ne'er so vile or frog-faced, or inconveniently located. Anyone who's been asked to study here has their work already before them. The university's job, your job, is merely to clear their path, and perhaps throw them in with a few fellow obsessives who may be headed in a similar direction. Innovation always, collaboration sometimes, but at Aldergate we're too enthralled by our own business to mind anyone else's. <laughs> You've been away too long, self, my lad. You've let yourself forget. 
If you're going to make a successful break from the bastards, you've got to break out of their busybody mindset, too. Yes. Anyhow, you found your destination all right in the end. It turns out that the office of the Vice-Chancellor is in the southeast corner of Sentad, right up at the top. Unfortunately, there's a far easier way of getting there than the one you took. After your spot of havoc reeking, you made a beeline for the first exit sign you saw, and that pointed you, uh, not to an exit, naturally, but to a long and echoing stairwell. Sentad has a lot of stairwells, you found, and you must have clambered up and or down all of them besides trekking overland through just about every administrative organ in the university's bureaucratic corpus. You even passed Baz's office, whatever organ she is. The hypothalamus, no doubt, and possibly the irritable bowel. She wasn't there, however, which piqued your concern. You'd not forgotten that mysterious letter, and when you found her post deserted, you were pretty well convinced that you'd find her in your office, with a corpse and a horror story. None of the underlings you found scuttling in the vicinity seemed to know where she had got to. They were, however, able to finally steer you true, and at long last you fetched up at the door of the office of the Vice-Chancellor of Aldergate University. And fancy your surprise to see that the familiar face awaiting you belonged not to Dame Bathsheba folks, but to good old Dr. Kilbury. Well then, things seem to be looking up, don't they? Our hero is settling in admirably, reacquainting himself with good old Aldergate University, both physically and spiritually. And now it seems he's due for a joyous reunion with his old friend and mentor. Rather raises the question, what can have happened subsequently to have reduced him to a demoralized jellyfish? We shall just have to see, shan't we? Join me every second Sunday for a fresh episode of The Aldergate Papers. Do please find The Aldergate Papers on Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review. And spread the word, won't you? Point your friends to thealdergatepapers.com Until next time... I am, and shall remain, your humble servant, Adrian Ward.